Good morning and welcome to the Learn and Grow series, monthly seminars presented by the Williamsburg Botanical Garden. I am Judith Alberts and I serve on the Garden's Board of Directors. I always do this, always forget to activate. There we go. Housekeeping for today. Yes, we are recording and you'll get a link to the replay within 48 hours and then it's going to be posted on YouTube. Or actually, that's where you'll be seeing it. All participants should be muted and we always recommend or we're beginning to recommend that you turn off your camera for privacy. We also recommend that you close other applications and devices that might eat up your bandwidth and interfere with the Zoom platform. We're going to be using the chat box for questions and um, depending on what it is, we may interrupt Justin or we'll answer them at the end. Bear with us, we are volunteers. To our regular garden visitors, volunteers, and learn and grow attendees, it's great to see you here again. And it's also nice to see the sun shining today. But we have a lot of new guests today. So the first thing to know for you newcomers about the garden is that it is open every day of the year from 7 a.m. until dusk, and it is always free to visit. The Williamsburg Botanical Garden is quite small. It's only two acres in what is actually a traffic circle on the road, in the road on the way to the Freedom Park parking area. But we pack a lot into those two acres. We have 18 different types of habitat, including a wildflower meadow, woodlands, an English style cottage garden, three different types of wetlands, a succulents and rock garden, an iris garden, and native grasses to name just a few. Our garden is intentionally more natural than what you might expect when you hear those words botanical garden. It is definitely not a precisely manicured display of high maintenance plantings. It's more like a wild child that emphasizes native plants and practices that will support pollinators such as leaving standing stems during the winter to provide habitat. It is officially registered as Monarch Butterfly Way Station number 3394. The garden's mission is to demonstrate environmentally responsible and sustainable gardening practices and to offer education on related topics. Everything in the garden is tended by dedicated volunteers on a slim budget. And yes, here comes the pitch. The garden is a 501 C3 nonprofit corporation that receives no funding from any level of government. Our learn and grow programs are free and under normal circumstances, there'd be a donations jar at the registration table, which historically has been a steady revenue stream for the garden. But hence COVID-19 and virtual learn and grow sessions. So, the link to the recording will include a handy link to our virtual donations jar. If you'd like to further support the garden, please consider a membership. Brent and, Bucky, Brent and Becky's Bulbs in Gloucester donates a very generous 25% of total orders to nonprofits in their Bloomin' Bucks program. But you have to start your order at bloominbucks.com. And of course, there's Amazon. Now, if you shop on Amazon, please start at smile.amazon so that a portion of your purchase will support the garden or any other nonprofit of your choice. When we started monitoring our dashboard last June, we had only five supporters and now we have 21. So I'm all tickled about that because every penny helps. The garden is on Facebook. And if you raise monarch butterflies, please consider joining our Milkweed Connection Facebook group. Here's our YouTube channel. And here's what's coming up. Learn and Grows will remain virtual until further notice. And the March 20th program is yeah. on composting. Compost is garden gold. In April, <clears throat> It's going to be get to know that snake in the grass, all about the reptiles and amphibians that are 
our garden guests with Megan Thomas, certified wildlife biologist with the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. And in May, <clears throat> volcano mulching and other tree crimes with Patsy McGrady. Last item before I introduce today's speaker, master naturalists and master gardeners <clears throat> um, may count this as continuing education units. Today's program is from the ground up, seed starting success. And our speaker is Justin Luis Diaz, who comes from a family of avid home vegetable and flower gardeners. He is the proprietor of Mockingbird Farmstead, a half acre market garden with plots around the Williamsburg, Virginia area. He offers seasonal farm shares and pastured egg deliveries. He started Mockingbird Farmstead in late 2015 to share his love of great homegrown produce conveniently and affordably with his community. You'll also find Mockingbird Farmstead on Instagram and on YouTube. In 2017, Justin combined his love for growing things with his passion for educational outreach by joining the Virginia Cooperative Extension Master Gardener Program, and he's a member of the class of 2018. He also works closely supporting other local farmers and community education programs as the assistant manager for the Williamsburg Farmers Market. So thank you. And welcome to Justin Lewis Diaz. I will stop my share. It's all yours, Justin. Thank you. I will start my share. Just want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. Yep. Everybody, Audio's good. We can see my screen share okay. Screen share is good. Great. Thank you so much, Miss Miss uh, Miss Judith Alberts. Thank you for for setting this up for everybody. Good morning, everyone. It is good to see all of your shining faces. Uh, I don't know if anybody's noticed or if it's just me, but there seems to be a giant glowing ball of light in the sky. Uh, it's new, I guess. I've never seen it before. I'm I'm told it's the sun, and it is in fact a star orbiting near us. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> So from the ground up, seed starting success. Um, it is a pleasure for me to be here and share this with everybody. This is one of the one of the areas, one of the topics that a lot of people feel a lot of anxiety about and a lot of stress about. And we're right at that time of year um, where it is a good time to start start our seed. So what I'd like to do today is just kind of chat about some of the uh, some of the ways that you can kind of put yourself at ease, I guess, is the best way to put it. Put yourself at ease, become familiar, build more of a, an intuitive understanding of how seed starting and getting the seeds out into the, your garden beds, your pots, your planters, or into the field, depending on, you know, what, what your case might be. So um, before, before we get too deep into it, I, I really, truly mean this. I, I very sincerely mean this, and I hope you believe me when I say it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean that. I'm not here to try to convince you to change everything that you're doing. Uh, some of the things that I do are different because they work for me in my particular context. Um, so when I share them with you, I hope you keep that in mind. If you've been successfully starting seeds for decades... Um, it would be kind of silly for me to come in and say, hey, whatever you're doing, you're doing it wrong. That's not the right way to do it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to do that. Um, one of what I've found running my business and finding the success that I've had is that you don't really know or you can't really predict where that next critical nugget of information is going to come from. And so just being open to different ways of doing things and just kind of taking little pieces here or there, the things that might work for you and, and kind of folding them into your cultural practices, um, that, that's really what's, what's supported me the most as I've been trying to grow here. And so um, just kind of keep an open mind and, and take what you can. I hope, I hope there's a couple nuggets in here for you. Uh, guess what? chicken butt I, I i couldn't help it we have we have uh we have a small flock of chickens this is laverne's tush um the talk isn't about our chickens but they're 
how could I not talk about them? I love them so much. I'm sorry. I know I know how bad and corny that was, but I, I couldn't help it. Um, so this is what we're going to be working on today. Um, the brief overview, part one, getting seeds to germinate, and then part two, keeping seedlings alive. We're going to be, there's going to be some overlap of topics there. Um, they're very closely related, but they are distinct phases in getting your seedlings to grow. And um, part three, into the garden. Um, while we're talking about this, remember what we're trying to do is a, a temporary process and it's an artificial process. We are trying to get seeds to grow and germinate in a way that is familiar to them that they would like to grow in, but that's not what the end goal is. The end goal isn't to keep them under artificial lights or in windowsills and forever. It's if you wanted to do a hydroponic setup or something like that, where you would be keeping tropical plants in an enclosed thing, that's fine. That's just, that's a different kind of thing. What, what, what we're talking about here is keeping the end goal of getting the seedlings that we're starting in the winter time, end of winter, early spring, um, into the garden, late spring, early summer. Um, that's always the goal that we're working towards. And so everything we do should kind of help facilitate that in some way. Um, the last part, where do we go wrong? By the time we start talking about troubleshooting and the way things will you know, might likely go wrong for some people. What we will hopefully find out is that the answers have emerged from a more intuitive understanding of the seed starting process that we've that we built up throughout the talk. So everything should kind of fall into place there. And then last, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Um, and I will talk to you about some resources for you to continue your journey and um, to support you through that process. Part one, getting the seeds to germinate. What we have uh, here, these are some arugula microgreens that have sprouted. Um, as, I, as I mentioned when we were talking about the overview, there, there's really two different parts to, to keeping our seedlings alive and happy. We have to get them started. We need to germinate them, and then we need to keep them alive. And that is it's actually usually the keeping alive part that most people struggle with, but we'll, we'll get into it here. So how does a seed sprout? This is a diagram of, uh, I, don't, I would call this a kidney bean, a bean seed. Kidney beans are dicotyledonous. You see uh, it says di, uh, it says cotyledon. Um, the contents of this diagram are not necessarily important for you to memorize. Uh, committing this image and burning it to your into your into your brain isn't really what's going to help you um, but we need to start somewhere and so um, what i'd like for you to to focus on here is the cotyledon and it makes up a large portion of virtually all seeds um, what happens is that because seeds are seeds are very they're they're really incredible biochemical machines and they're in a dormant state and to awaken them there are a couple of things that we really need and they, they just won't awaken from that state to start growing without these things. Um, the first is moisture and all seeds need moisture to start. And then the second determining factor there would be temperature, but the temperature range is actually pretty wide. And so when we start talking about ideal temperature temperatures for seeds to germinate at, we're, we're kind of talking about for 99% success rates, or it'll never be 99%, hopefully, but but usually 80% is what we think of as good. Um, if it's below that, usually it's labeled as such. Um, what we're talking about is, is a, it's a range, it's a range. So how do we know where to start? Um, people tend to ask a lot of questions about, you know, the secret tricks for how, oh, I have had trouble getting this seed to start. I've had trouble getting this one to start, or I don't think the seeds are germinating. Um, where, where do we start? And so I have, um, this is a, a milkweed packet that I have from a company called Seed Needs. And this is the back of the packet. If you're buying your seeds in packets, absolutely start at the back of the packet. The seed producers are highly motivated 
to give you everything you need to find success. It's there. That's what they want to do. They want you to come back next season and buy more seeds from them. And so they should provide for you all the information you need to find success growing your seeds. So definitely start at the back of the packet. There is some stuff that you may need to decode on the back of the packet, but it's it, there, there really shouldn't be. It should be very evident the way uh, you're intended to start the seeds. So just to go through quickly on the back of this, place seeds in fridge for three to six weeks. This is a process called stratification. Stratification is, um, so we talked about moisture to, uh, as a trigger for starting seeds. Rarely, not rarely, but seeds that are wildflowers or, detend, or descended from wildflowers or seeds that um, are naturalized to areas often need to undergo a process called stratification. Stratification is, is a cold period. So what we're trying to do is mimic uh, the seed falling off of a plant, spending its, you know, fall and winter months exposed to the elements, that cold dip, and then the warm up again in spring as it's cued to germinate. Um, Asclepius uh, or milkweed, it's uh, typically a naturalized plant. We see them growing in the wild in Virginia and around most of North America. And so um, they do benefit from that. It's not really common, especially if we're talking about annual flowers and we're talking about annuals that we might grow in a vegetable garden. Um, starts indoors six to eight weeks prior to the last frost. So we're in zone 7b. Our last frost date is middle of April sometime. Um, I tend to make it my birthday. Um, but it's around that time. So we'll just count backwards six to eight weeks from there. <clears throat> Excuse me, it says, so at a depth of 1 16th of an inch under topsoil, uh, that's, that's kind of a sprinkle, just a light sprinkle, transplant or direct sow your seeds outdoors, another way to grow them. Uh, if you're working with wildflowers uh, and things that are naturalized, a, a great way to plant them is to just kind of sprinkle them in the fall for the, for the following spring, just sprinkle them on the ground where, where you'd like your wildflower patch to grow in the spring. Um, and uh, it says transplant or direct sow your seeds outdoors <clears throat> when the weather becomes warm. So although the seeds are happy growing or, or uh, experiencing the cold and winter, wet winter weather, um, those frosty temps, the young growing plant might not be. So we're just following what's going on on the back of on the back of the packet. Asclepius can tolerate many soil conditions, but just make sure the soil is well drained. We know what the soil should be like. An area of full sunlight, temperatures between 70 and 85 and above are optimal. Water daily, uh, seeds will begin to sprout within 14 to 28 days. Plants will grow to a height of 30 to 40. Everything you need to know should be readily available for you on the back of the seed packet. What do you do if it's not there? Well, we'll talk more about about resources uh, at the end of the talk, but there are many, many absolutely completely free and incredible resources available for you to answer any questions you might have. Um, it should be on there though. But there are cases, let's say uh, you, you've saved some seed or a neighbor has saved some seed. They're just gonna give it to you in a little plastic baggie or something like that. So this information might not be on there, but um, we'll go over that more towards the end. Justin? Yes. This might be a good time to ask, uh, someone who asked the question, how do you cold stratify? Cold, how to cold stratify, great question. There are, uh, a lot of different ways to successfully cold stratify. There's not one right way. An easy way to do it is to get a paper towel and soak the paper towel with some water. We want the water dripping off and then wring it out as good as you can. Fold the seeds into that, put that packet into a plastic bag, put the plastic bag into the refrigerator um, or into the freezer. And that should that should be all you need to do. Seeds really, really want to grow. They really want to grow. And so if you just, honestly, if you would just take some seeds and you had the temperature right, if you, took, if you just took any seeds and you put them in that damp paper towel in a plastic bag and you put it on the counter, in a week, something would happen. You would get stuff growing there. So when we talk about needing stratification, again, we're talking about a range of success. We're not talking about, it's not an on-off switch. They're not, 
not going to grow. You'll have likely reduced germination rates, which nobody really wants. Um, but it's not like nothing at all will happen. So we just just want to keep that in mind. Um, a lot of people actually store their wildflower seeds in a plastic bag in the refrigerator and just leave them in there. As soon as they come in the mail, just keep them in the refrigerator. As soon as the temperature raises, when you pull them out, when the moisture is there, that's going to be their cue to start sprouting. So um, that's great for, for a spring planting uh, wildflower garden. If you're going to plant a wildflower garden and you're going to need seeds that, or you're going to use seeds that need to be stratified, again, the easiest way to do it is the previous fall sprinkle them out if you have we will have a number of frosts before the spring warms up now would be a great time now would be a really great time to sprinkle out some some wildflower seeds and, and other other seeds that need stratifying like uh, like milkweed like we were just talking about just kind of drop them in there's a, a very common way right around now even in areas with snow to get poppies poppies are our uh, our variety of plant that really like that cold hit before they germinate <clears throat> there's a lot of people that are just where they know where they're going to go and they're just sprinkling the seeds right onto the snow when as the snow melts the seeds are going to hit the cold of the snow as the snow melts the seeds are going to fall down slowly into place and they'll be good to go they'll be good to go in the spring when the temps warm up i hope that helped um timing timing is key now there's a lot of things about this that, that we should talk about, but what I mean primarily by timing is key is that when the seed packet tells you when to start the seed or when your seed starting information, wherever you get it from, if it's not on the seed packet, when it says to start the seed, it, it's within the context of this being, again, this is a temporary process that we're trying to do here. So a, a good example of this is, is starting tomatoes. There are so many people that are ready to start or have already started their tomatoes in our growing zone. We have at least a week or two. You could even wait three or four weeks, probably five or six weeks even to start your tomatoes and still have, still have fantastic crops of tomatoes. When we start them too soon, what ends up happening is the the little baby seedlings, when we have success germinating them, they will grow too big. And their roots will kind of knot up and pack around in the little cells or the little pots that you're growing them in. And they also typically lighting is an issue that we have when we're starting seeds indoors because we, we can't really compete with the sun. So things start to get long and spindly and leggy because there's that lack of light. And so the longer we keep the seedlings in this artificial situation, the longer we were on the risk of weaker plants going out into the garden. And we don't want to spend weeks or months working to have healthy, happy seedlings only to throw it away when we try to transplant something out that's just not going, going to make it. So timing is key. Really pay attention. Everybody, you know, you we come through, I, I maybe not everybody, but I certainly do. We start to get the seed catalogs at the end of December, sometimes even in the fall. And uh, there are some things to plant in the fall and through the winter or that it's okay to plant, like if we're, you know, putting garlic out or something like that, but resist the urge to start things too soon. That's a, a that's a big one. And it's also, it, it, it seems obvious. The longer we have of a head start, the more we'll be able to harvest at the end, right? But it's, we're cramming our seedlings in a confined and artificial setup, and that's not really what they want. We want to keep them in that only as long as we need to, and then get them where they will be most happy, uh, most happy as, as quickly as possible. Uh, a big, this, this is such a, such a big issue for a lot of people. Um, and I think that this is, if we're talking about step one being germinating the seeds and step two or concern one being germinating the seeds and step two being keeping the seedlings alive. Um, one of the biggest problems with step one germinating the seeds is the viability of the seeds. And so where'd you get the seeds? How old are they? Where were they? <clears throat> A close friend of ours um, had an ant and the ant moved. And when the ant was moving, uh, when they were cleaning out her attic, 
which was, I, I believe, in North Carolina. They found box after box of seeds. And the seeds that they found, and this was a year ago, the seeds that they found were from 2007. And they were stored in an attic in North Carolina. So we're, when we're talking about viability, first of all, those seeds are ancient. Will some of them sprout? Yes, some of them, some of them will sprout. Will enough of them sprout for it to be worth it for us to try? I wouldn't try. Um, would, especially because if you, if you think about it, we, you, you get your pots together, you get your soil medium together, you get your light set up, you have everything ready to go. You got your labels printed out or your labels written out and you put the seeds in and now you're going to wait how long three weeks four weeks how long is too long to wait for nothing to happen and now you're a month into the future or a month behind depending on how you want to look at it with nothing to show for it so i i really would not take a risk and this is compounded by uh where are many people getting their seeds from well where do we see the the stands of seed packets we see them in hardware stores um home depot has a large section with seed packets in it. And I'm sure millions of people find success with those seed packets, but we want to store seeds the same way, the same way we would store prized family photo albums. We want darkness, we want cool temperatures, and we want low to no humidity. That's where that's where seeds are going to remain viable and last the longest. And the seeds at a place like Home Depot, I don't know if you, if you, if you can picture the one here in Williamsburg, but they're, they're by, the, by the automatic doors on the way out to the garden area. And so what's, <laughs> what's happening is in the summertime, it's August, it's 100 degrees outside, they're blasted with 100% humidity, 103 degree air. And then the doors close and then there's a rush of cold, dry air from the air conditioning inside. And they're just cycled like this forever. And so would you find success with those seeds? I'm sure. Is that your best shot? I really don't think it is. And so where do we go? We're looking for reputable seed manufacturers. Go directly to the source. If you are getting packets of Burpee seeds, Burpee brand seeds from Home Depot on their little packet rack, go to the Burpee website and get the seeds directly from them. They will be in their climate controlled warehouse and they will get them directly to you in a few days or a week in the mail. And that, that's going to be your best bet. So many people find discouragement in the lack of or in the low rates of germination that they have. And viability is, is how we kind of talk about that. So we want to keep, again, we want to keep seeds cool we want to keep them dry and we want to keep the temperature consistent. We also want to keep them in the dark, like just like you would want a, 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 a family photo album, a, a prized heirloom photo album. Keep it safe. Moisture. So moisture is always a trigger for getting seeds to germinate. And so it, it is critical. Um, it is more critical after the seeds have germinated. Monitoring moisture and adjusting moisture after the seeds after the seeds have germinated is what's really going to get you into trouble or keep your seedlings happy. At this stage, as I mentioned before, if you have seeds and you put them in a damp paper towel in a plastic bag, they're going to grow. As long as the seeds are viable, they will absolutely grow. Um, it is actually a really great way to test how viable your seeds are. Uh, you get a, a known number of seeds, put them in that damp paper towel, put them in a window, in a windowsill or on a counter, someplace where the temperature is consistent, light or no light, doesn't even really matter. What you want to do is just give them a week, come back in a week and open them up, pull them out and count them. You'll get a reasonable germination rate out of that. So the more seeds you use, the more granular your germination rate can be. You know, if I put 10 seeds in there and three of them germinate, I'm at 30%. If I put 3000 seeds in there, obviously when I do the math on that, I'll, I'll get a more, a more precise number, but that's a really great way to test at home. So when we're talking about moisture, how much is too much? If you took a handful of your growing medium and you squished it in your hands if any water would drip out that would be too much 
pretty much anything below that is great. If you would, uh, in terms of how much is too little, if you would try to make a ball after having watered it, and when you opened your hands, it just crumbled into dust again, that would not be enough. So the range is pretty wide in terms of what will work to get seeds to germinate. It's kind of what happens after they've germinated and they're already tiny plants that we need to really, really focus in on moisture. Mix. So this is the growing medium. And it's really important. Now, what do most of you guys use? A lot of people use um, peat moss, right? A sterile growing medium. I don't use a sterile growing medium. There's peat moss in my mix. Um, the background of the presentation is a larger image of the seed starting soil mix that I have uh, on the right of the screen now. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in there. So what are, what are we asking the mix to do for us? Well, <sighs> If we were growing hydroponically, honestly, our soil mix would be fiberglass insulation. They call it rock wool because it sounds better than fiberglass house insulation, but seeds get planted directly into fiberglass house insulation and they happily grow and live their entire lives in that. Now, there's no nutrients in there for them. So the nutrients would have to be supplied at a later date. Um, that's a big point of contention for a lot of people also, which we'll talk about. Um, what are we adding? When should we add it? Um, fertilizers, for example. Um, what we're really asking our mix to do for us is to keep them happy long enough for us to get them safely into their final home. And that could be, again, your garden, a raised bed. It could be a pot or a large planter, or it could be your farm. Um, it's the same. We want to spend as little time as we can doing that and keeping them in that artificial situation so that when we get them to where they're going to go, finally, they've spent as little time there as possible. They've, we really, really need to get them where they're going to be most happy. Um, the more we kind of put that off, the more we are pressing our luck in terms of things that could go wrong. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, it is my perspective and my strong advice to you, if you're uncertain, um, to first keep doing what you're doing if it works. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, second, only view the mix as a temporary home for your seeds and your seedlings. Keep that in mind as we move on. Temperature. The temperature range that we can get seeds to germinate at is pretty huge. We're not talking about what temperature will any seeds germinate at. We're talking about what temperature will most of our seeds germinate at. Remember, this is a range that we're talking about. And so it's important to understand that although some things have an ideal range of temperature to grow in, as long as you keep most seeds, most seeds above room temperature, they're going to grow. Seeds want to grow. They really do. Now, seeds that enjoy warmer temperatures are things like uh, solanaceae crops, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. Those like a little bit warmer, 85, 90 degrees. Um, things like um, brassicas also do well. Cabbages, kales, collards, those things really not only do they germinate more quickly, but the germination is more uniform. So from my perspective, when I'm sowing, uh, let's say collard greens, for example, we have a flat with 200 cells in it. In one day, I will see at the right temperature, like 185 of those cells all break the surface at the same time. If we had a lower temperature, I would see in the end, 185 seeds germinate, but it'll be over the course of two or three days. So the germination won't necessarily be as uniform, but I'm still gonna hit that target. Um, a good warm place, and we will talk about temperature later to keep these guys happy and, and how you can do that. Um, a nice warm place would be top of the fridge. That's a great place to do it. Um, this is the exact heat mat that I use. I'm not sponsored by VivoSun. This is not a plug for them. This is just what this is what I happen to use. Um, and the lower right quadrant of the heat mat that's there, um, there's a little table, and the table has ideal 
what they consider to be ideal temperature ranges for seed germination. Um, the image on the left is my good friend and colleague, Liz Callen. What she has rigged for herself is a seed starting tray and for a humidity dome to keep the moisture on the seeds until they germinate, she has used a Walmart plastic bag. And the container that they're on is a Tupperware container, like a Tupperware casserole dish. And inside of it is a strand of just your regular old fashioned incandescent Christmas lights. So the small amount of warmth that they give off is going to be great for getting so many different kinds of seeds to start. Now, the difference between the heat mat that I use um, and the Christmas light method, um, it doesn't really matter if they both work. So it doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to spend lots of money on a fancy uh, heating mat. If it works, it works. That's, and that's what you need to happen. So just really kind of focus on that. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, I enjoy that I can really dial mine in with a digital control and the, the temperature sensor on it, but that's, you probably don't need to do that at all. So there's not really a good reason for the average person to do that. They sell them in different sizes. So this one is um, 48 by 20. So that holds four 1020 trays next to each other, which is a huge amount. Um, they also sell them that are just the size of uh, just one single tray. So there's, you know, there's a wide range in there. Um, completely unnecessary though. And especially depending upon the type of seed. So um, a very common seed that we might try to grow that doesn't need any heat and grows exceedingly well at room temperature, any kind of lettuce. Lettuce germination is at its peak at just room temp, 70, 60, 68, 70, 72, right in there. Beautiful for lettuce. Light, do we need it? Spoiler, not really yet. So what I have on the, on the right is one of these newfangled um, grow lights, LED grow lights. It's got that purple color to it. I think we've all seen them. It's probably a $150 LED bulb. Um, do seeds need light to germinate? They do not. Now, we're not talking about the plant breaking the soil surface. Germination has already happened. Germination is when the seed itself comes to life and all the mechanical process, uh, bio, biochemical processes start happening in there and it starts to grow. The seed will open, you'll get the little, the little root will start to go down and then we'll get the cotyledons starting to emerge. That's germination. That happens before you know it because it's all happening underground. We don't really need light to make that happen. Now I say not really because there are some seeds that do benefit from a little bit of light. Um, dandelion seeds, pansy or viola seeds. Um, some people say it helps lettuce seeds. I don't find that at all. Um, I'm, I'm missing like a thousand of them, but there are many, there are many seeds where light aids germination, but there are very few seeds that will not germinate without light. And because that's such a special case, like stratification, it will be clearly marked for you. And if for some reason it's not clearly marked for you, never buy seeds from that company again. And please tell me who they are. That's horrible. Why would you do that to someone? These seeds don't need water. That's what it sounds like to me. Anyway. So when we're talking about trying to get successful germination to happen. There are two main knobs that we are going to turn. The moisture knob and the temperature knob. If you have seeds and you are really unsatisfied with the germination rates that you're getting from them, the first two places to check and really the most important places, I might even go as far as to say the only places to check are moisture and temperature. Remember, if we get the moisture and temperature right, seeds will grow in a Ziploc baggie with a damp paper towel in the dark on a counter. Okay, seeds want to grow. If they're not, the moisture and the temperature are the first two places to check. Keeping seedlings alive. Uh, on the right, we have those are those little guys are Napa cabbage seedlings. Um, this is where most people start to run into trouble because seeds want to grow. They really do. 
you add a little moisture and you'll get your seed to sprout. Once it's sprouted, we start running into, in, into a lot more problems. Uh, and it's a bummer because as soon as those first true leaves appear, you know, we're, we're almost in the clear, really. Um, what we see that comes out of the ground first as a seedling emerges are not leaves. They're called cotyledons. Um, there are dicotyledonous plants and monocotyledonous plants, um, di meaning two and mono meaning one. Monocotyledonous plants only put up one. It's not really a seed. Uh, it's not really a leaf. It's kind of like an energy storage structure mixed with a little bit of chlorophyll and energy production kind of thing and nutrient production kind of thing. It has all the all the entry, uh, energy and nutrients that seeds need to get that root down, get the stem up and get those first leaves grown. And when the first leaves are grown, they take over the energy production and nutrient production for the plant along with the roots. Um, once we get those first true leaves to show, we're, we're almost in the clear. So we just got to kind of get them to that stage. And this whole thing, remember, this is a temporary situation. The seedlings are not going to stay in the situation forever. So we only have to maintain these good conditions for them for a short time. So the number one killer of seedlings, take a second. I'm gonna grab a sip of coffee. What do you think the number one killer of seedlings is? Oh, it's love. Love is the number one killer of all seedlings. Everyone shares the same seedling love language at first, uh, and it's overwatering. Overwatering, <laughs> overwatering leads to almost every problem that we have keeping seedlings alive. Almost every single one is traced to how we manage the moisture of our seedlings. And we want the seedlings to do, I understand where it comes from, and every, I'm guilty of this as well. I, I get it. You know, we, we want them to do well. We want them to grow. What can we do? Is it easy for you to stand there and just watch them for weeks as they slowly, you know, first we see nothing for days, if not weeks. And we just, we're just going to, are you just going to stand there and do nothing, continue to do nothing? No, we want to do something. We want to be, we want to actively participate in this success. Really the only tool we have at our disposal is just to add some water. I think I think it's pretty common to say that most people understand that we probably shouldn't just put full strength fertilizer on seedlings. It might not be. If it's not, that's okay. I'm here to tell you now, don't do that. We'll talk about that also. But moisture, this is really the only way we get to show our little, little green guys that we love them. And so that's what people do. And when we think about things like the soil mix, it, when we have something like, have you ever, have you ever had just regular peat moss? Have you ever had just a bag of soil mix or one of those little pucks, those little compressed peat moss pucks with the little netting around it that's biodegradable but never goes anywhere? How long do those take to absorb water? They take ages to absorb water. And then when they absorb water, they really don't let it go. And so we have this swampy situation where, where we have these, these seedlings starting and that's, that's problematic. Um, but what happens when the surface dries out? Well, it kind of, when we're talking about just pure, pure peat moss, the surface kind of becomes hard and a little crunchy. And then when you go to water it, it's hydrophobic and the water just kind of skips off. So just add a little bit more water to make sure that it's wet, right? That's how common is that? And so that moisture, that, that abundance of moisture is, is where we get disease from. It is where we get a lack of nutrient uptake from it is where we get virtually every single problem that we will run into. We get fungus gnats from it. Who's had fungus gnat problems? We're going to fix it. Don't worry. Now, it's a tightrope in a way. It's really not, but it feels like it. It feels like it's a tightrope because we need the moisture there to get the seed to activate. We need it to start and to germinate and, and to wake up from its stasis, right? And so we got to get the, we got to get the moisture in there. And so the image I have here, these are sunflower seedlings. Um, they are very delicious. I don't know if you've ever had sunflower microgreens, but they're delicious. Um, but what we see, we see the two big cotyledons opening. And they are like, that's our sign 
that they don't really need moisture in the same way. So um, there is, if I can, um, we have one kind of in the center here and it's opened up and one is kind of, it's kind of doing, I don't know, kind of doing this type of thing. And then there's another one and it's kind of closed up still a little bit and we can see part of the seed hull on there. We want to keep, I have, you see the drips hanging from the ceiling there. This is a humidity dome that is over, uh, over the seed starting tray and that's to keep the moisture in. As soon as this, as the cotyledons are open and most of the seeds have germinated, that dome is coming off. We keep thinking these are, you know, fragile little guys and we want to protect them. Well, they're not going to be protected when we plant them out. And it's not that we need to be harsh to them now, but they're a lot less fragile than many people think they are. And what we're running the risk of is inviting disease and pest problems. If we keep that stagnant air in there and we keep that moisture in there, that's when we start running into problems. So Keep the moisture in there until they come up, until the seed hulls, because the hulls need to be softened and the humidity does that. Otherwise they will pinch on and the, the hull will stay on and they'll pinch the cotyledons. The plant will still probably grow, but that's not ideal. So we wanna keep, keep it on there until, until the cotyledons open all the way up and then take it off and don't put it back on. It's done. That's what it was for, job done. Um, to that end, one of the ways that disease impacts plants, one of the most common ways, so we have like, you know, there are disease vectors like uh, pest insects, okay? So those are a problem. But one of the main ways that things, especially like molds, um, especially water molds and uh, fungi, they get onto plants by water, the spores are in the soil, water hits the soil and splashes the spores up onto the plant. So to keep moisture on your seedlings, I recommend bottom watering. This avoids getting those spores disturbed from the soil surface and up onto the leaves. It doesn't have to be fancy. So uh, Kevin Lee Jacobs, he has a, a website, a garden for the house. Um, he's got these little great milk jug greenhouses. And he's had a lot of success with them. We can see all kinds of things growing in here. It looks like he's got squash growing in there, maybe some purslane, um, lettuces, some mustards, maybe even carrots in there. So, you know, parsley, the works. So uh, what we have here is a humidity dome. And then when we go to harden off, which we'll talk about in a little bit, when we go to harden off our, our seedlings later, um, that'll, that'll provide a little bit of protection. So once the seedlings have sprouted, the dome should come off unless we're trying to protect them from the frost or swinging, widely swinging temperatures. But that's, that's kind of in the, we're getting the plants outside and getting them used to, used to their home step. So we're not, we're not quite there yet. But again, it doesn't have to be fancy. We saw, uh, again, my good friend Liz used a plastic bag to keep the humidity on there. Um, I use the humidity domes because that makes sense for me. Kevin Lee Jacobs uses milk jugs and some duct tape to keep them close. If it works, it works. Air, every single part of the plant respires. Every part of the plant respires. The roots respire, all of the cells on the stems, the cotyledons and the leaves flower petals, flowers, every part of the plant respires. This also, therefore, implies that there would be damage if we prevented that respiration from happening. And that's absolutely true and that's absolutely possible. And the number one way that happens is not by keeping a humidity dome on it for too long and restricting airflow. Although good airflow is important, we understand that when we're trying to keep disease pressure down on plants, ensuring that good airflow is present is key, okay? Oxygen, we understand that oxygen has uh, healthful benefits to everything in terms of keeping disease pressures down. And plants are no exception, especially these, these uh, our little seedling guys. But the number one way to restrict airflow to plants is by just overwatering. And so we create this situation where the roots are literally drowning. 
the roots respire and they respire a lot. And if we drown them, we end up weakening the plant. And once the plant is weakened, we now make it a prime target for those disease vectors. And we do not want that to happen. So we have airflow being important because we understand that as the things are respiring, oxygen is key. We understand also that good airflow helps reduce the amount of diseases because A, healthier plants resist diseases more, and B, almost all of the diseases that affect plants like some type of overly moist environment. I don't know, what am I, four, D, C, G? Um, keeping the roots able to breathe. Allowing that oxygen to get into the soil and work in the soil helps support the plant health, but it also excludes the bad guys. Almost all of the bacteria and fungal problems that we might experience like, I don't even want to say it, damping off, like those, they're really, they come about because there's reduced air and there's a, a, a happily anaerobic kind of thing happening down there. We notice it's anaerobic by the smell usually. It's got a swampy, not nice kind of a smell to it. And that's, that's kind of a, a key sign that we're overwatering. So air and moisture are very closely linked in terms of ensuring the health and longevity of your little seedlings. So make sure the airflow is good. Uh, this is Tammy. And Tammy is a uh, girl. She is not looking great. Tammy, this is, this is uh, so chickens molt once a year, right? Uh, Tammy doesn't look good <laughs> because she just molted. These are the scraggly feathers that she has left. She has new pin feathers coming in around her face. Um, she has a nictitating membrane that's come up over her eye, which makes it look cloudy. It's a bad, T Tammy is there because I'm about to ruffle some feathers about light. And uh, I couldn't resist sharing this picture of, oh, Tammy. So light, how much, what color, what kind? And we have windowsill crossed out here. How much light? Well, you can't, you, as much as you can. You cannot though, you, you can't provide enough light. You just cannot. Commercial growers that have multi-thousand dollar systems struggle to get enough light. You cannot get enough light on your plants. I cannot get enough light on my plants. We are competing with the sun for amount of nutritious light to give our seedlings and we're just gonna fall short, okay? But that doesn't mean we can't still do our best. And this is where everything, everybody starts to get kind of uh, surprisingly persnickety about the kinds of light that we should use. So. We saw before that purple colored LED grow light. If you've seen grow lights before, uh, they're that nice purple color. Uh, occasionally there's a UV component to them. And when we're talking about keeping plants alive long-term, um, it is hypothesized widely that bluer colors of light support vegetative growth while red, more reddish colors of light support flowering and fruiting growth. Um, that's that's not where we are though that's not long term as soon as as soon as long term comes into the equation that's not what we're talking about we're not talking about starting seeds we're not talking about getting our seedlings ready happy and healthy we're talking about a different thing and so we don't need that that's not something to worry about in that same way um we need a bright light as bright as you can um it if it tends to the blue end of the spectrum, things called daylight, um, that's kind of good. That's, that's better, okay? The warmer lights that look better in your house maybe, um, those are not as great, but we're talking about brightness. Brightness has way more of an effect on, on a plant growing than the color of the light does. And what kind of light? So. It doesn't really matter, okay? Um, there are practical concerns though. So um, I use just daylight colored LED shop lights. That's it. I have, 
I don't know how many, 36, 40 of those shop lights, something. And that's it. That's all I use. And that is absolutely fine. I like the LEDs because they stay cool. They are inexpensive and they are very bright for their little package. That's, that's all you need. Okay. When we're talking about what kind, what we want to avoid are incandescent lights. And the reason we want to get away from incandescent lights is because of the heat that they give off. So if you put the light far enough away from the plant that it won't burn if the light is incandescent or even some of the compact fluorescent bulbs can get pretty warm. Um, if you put it far away enough to keep the seedlings happy, the amount of light that it's transmitting by the time it travels that even though it's a short distance to the plant is half of what it could be putting out. So we're going to keep the, the lights as close to the plants as possible. We want to keep them as cool as possible. And we want to kind of shade, you know, to the bluer side of the spectrum, bright white, cool white, daylight color. These are, these are, these are the colors you want to try to be in. And they're, they're ubiquitous now. So they shouldn't be too hard to find, especially at big box stores. So why don't, I mean, we need the sun, right? The sun would be the ideal situation. So why don't we just put everything on the windowsill? Fair question. What do you think? It's not, it's not only about the light. So the first part of it is that what time of year are we trying to start these seeds? In the winter, at least early spring, right? What's the day length like? It's not long enough. It is definitely not the long, happy days of late spring, early summer, right? Short day length. There's not enough daylight in the sky. Second, what are your windows made out of? What kind of light filters do they have on them? What kind of light do they block and not allow into your house? Is there a screen blocking that light? We have a reduced number of hours. We're not sure what kind of, we're not sure even what kind of light is coming in through the window, how much light is coming in through the window. And uh, not related to light, but still very, very important. Most of us, even with really great windows, when it's cold outside, the window is cool. And down the face of the window, we have a cool draft. And when we keep that cool draft coming down and cooling, artificially cooling our seedlings, we create the ideal, the ideal conditions for a bad guy called Rhizoctonia to proliferate in the soil. And Rhizoctonia is like the number one cause of damping off root problems and disease in, in our little seedlings. And that is maybe even more so than the lack of light coming in the windowsill, that inconsistent temperature swinging or artificially cool temperatures, that is one of the number one contributing factors to failure of trying to get things started on the windowsill. And if you have a humidity dome over them, or you have some kind of structure, or there's really no, there's really no cold draft coming down your window, should you use it? Well, if it works for you, then yeah, you should really use it. The likelihood in most cases, all things being equal, is that there's some type of cooler draft coming down the window, and the windowsill is not really great. Also, who I'm lucky we have we happen to have here a a perfectly a perfectly south facing window and that's really great but not everybody does so when we're talking about light trying to keep it simple looking for daylight bulbs you'll see a number on them it's it's technically a temperature uh 6, k plus probably 5500 k plus would be better true daylight is somewhere around 6500 k uh k is for kelvins um, and we want it to be not too hot so compact fluorescence, fluorescent lights work great. Um, they do get warmer than LEDs. LEDs, I think, are ideal. LEDs are also because, because we can't get 
the same amount of light in the same intensity as the sun onto our seedlings, we need to extend the hours that we're putting light on the seedlings. So 16 to 18 hours a day of artificial light is ideal. Plants have their own natural light rhythms, and so they do need a period of darkness to be happy. 16 to 18 hours of artificial light is what you're going to want with a decent daylight colored LED or fluorescent bulb. Um, the other thing about LEDs is that when you're running them 16 or 18 hours a day, they're super low wattage, and that's, that's a really nice spot to be in. So part three, into the garden. I keep saying this is a temporary process and it is. We want to get our plants the happiest and healthiest they can be before we get them into the dirt. And that's because that's the goal. We're not starting a hydroponic system. If you are and you want some info about that or you want to know where to get started, please reach out to me. I would love to talk about that. Um, we're, trying to get, we're trying to get them in the dirt, right? We want crops out. Um, you want your flowers out, you want your beds full, you want, you know, your planters or your pots full. And that's where we need to go. So again, keep in mind, this is a temporary thing. We only have to keep these conditions right for our seeds and seedlings for a limited amount of time. <clears throat> so we know from where the seed packets are myriad online resources, your local Virginia uh, extension office. We know when it's time to plant the seedlings out. We have them in this well controlled, finely, finely controlled, cushy, temporary environment. And now we have to kind of kick them out into the harsh reality of the big wide world in the garden. And so that process is what we call hardening off. And as important as getting good quality seeds, getting good temperatures and moisture levels on them so that they germinate the way you'd like them to, using and creating a soil mix for them to live in, monitoring their humidity with a humidity dome, watering them, taking care of them, providing the light they need and the airflow that they need. As important as all of those things are, properly hardening them off, hardening them off is as important as all of those things. And the hardening off process is basically a gradual exposure to the elements, to the harsh power of the sunlight and we need to do that thoughtfully and gradually lots of things can go wrong if we don't but those are not the things we worry about we just worry about the way the successful process works so hardening off should take five to seven days the longer you can do it the better five days you could kind of do it in like three or four days don't do that though um five to seven days is ideal. Uh, we're talking about starting in the shade, reducing water, watching ambient temperatures, cold. If it's going to be cold, cover things up. If it's going to be too hot, give them some shade. There are different times of the year where we can transplant things out. It's not only going to be at the beginning of the spring. Um, it's much easier often to start your own seeds from spring and plant succession crops throughout the season. Um, by starting indoors and having your own little tiny transplants to go out there. So it should take five to seven days. What we're talking about is uh, day one, we're going to have our plants exposed to direct sunlight for like two hours. Day two, we're going to have our plant exposed to direct sunlight and whatever wind and rain for like four hours. Day three, six hours. Day four, seven hours. Day five, eight hours. Day six. So we're kind of slowly, kind of slowly acclimating things to what it's like to be in the sun. And this gives the leaves a time, uh, this gives the leaves time to build up all of their requisite chlorophyll stores 
and other things that they will need to really stay alive because when the sun is hitting them, they are going to be blasted. And we see if you try to rush this, if you would just take your seedlings and just plant them right in the ground without trying to harden them off, there will be huge amounts of shock to the plant and the leaves, you will see spots on the leaves that look like burnt, they're, they're sunburn. And that will absolutely happen. Um, so when we're doing this, uh, what I like to do is actually keep them outside, but in the shade near where the sun might hit for a day or two before I start introducing them into the sun. Um, and we want to start reducing the water and they have water in their little trays pretty much on demand. And that's great for them. Uh, unfortunately, that's not what it's going to be like, you know, out out in the garden, out in their, in their final destination. Um, and so we need to start acclimating the plant, acclimating the plant to the conditions that, you know, water is not always going to be on demand. If you want water, you're going to have to start moving your roots down and searching for it. Okay. You're going to have to understand how to exist when there's not water there every time that you need to do that. And one of those things, the plant does do that is it just really toughens up. One of the other stresses on it, and I, I sincerely mean this, one of the other stresses on it is wind, even just a little breeze. Um, we have these small, seemingly fragile plants, and they're kind of on the floppier side, right? And so we're just kind of thinking about like, when they get exposed and a breeze comes, a gust of wind comes, are they going to snap? when we get them in the dirt. So one of the things you can do, and again, I sincerely, I sincerely mean this, uh, just kind of, you know, brush them a little bit, give them a little, a little tickle when they're still in their trays, shake them up a little bit, start, you know, similar to how we're building muscle as humans. When we start to, you know, bend and flex the stems on the plants, we start to make little micro breaks and those strengthen up over time and they stiffen and they create a sturdier plant. So definitely one of the things you can do we even, couple of weeks before you're ready to harden off your plants, just kind of start brushing them, just brushing your hand over them gently. Um, and then watch for, watch the ambient temp. So if it's going to be cold, you're going to want to offer, you know, you're looking a week into the future as best you can for plunging temperatures. Okay. If it were me, I would wait a week and get the plants in the ground later and avoid a hard frost coming, then try to plant them sooner and hope I could properly protect them. Do not, you, if every, if, listen, if you're going to try and fight mother nature, you're going to lose. The best you can do is break even. It's not worth it. You don't want all of your weeks and months of work to go because you couldn't wait you know, another couple of days for that hard frost to pass before you put your plants out. You don't want to go through that. Promise me. I, I promise you when I tell you that, uh, you don't want to go through that. So uh, when it's cold, let's say three weeks, there's a free cold snap coming. Um, if it's going to be cold, any kind of a blanket will do. As long as it's not too heavy to crush the plants, anything will help. Um, and if it's too hot, so let's say what will we be planting at when it's too hot? That doesn't necessarily like it when it's hot. Lettuce, let's say we have uh, succession plantings of lettuce seedlings in our house, right? And we're getting those out so we can have salad in July. Lettuce doesn't really like heat. So one of the things we can do is use a shade cloth. And uh, on the right, I have uh, a raised garden bed in my yard. We have some white PVC tubes that are bent over it and screwed to the side. And then on top of that, we have a sheet of plastic. I could put a row cover over that to provide shade in the summer. Um, I could seal up the ends of that plastic to provide protection in the winter. That's an easy thing. Uh, it's less than $10 for, for all of those adjustments. Uh, super simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to work. Uh, even um, a clear solo cup turned upside down. You want to make sure it doesn't blow away, put a rock on it or something, but even just a little, a clear solo cup will offer some protection over a tiny seedling if you're in, in really dire straits to protect it. Um, but in the summertime, let's say when we're planting out what would be considered a cool weather crop like lettuce, uh, first thing we could do is wait to dusk to plant it. 
that would be ideal because once we plant it, we're going to water it. That water is going to sit there with it overnight. We're not going to be fighting the sun to keep the water in the soil. And then uh, just a little shade structure. Those PVC hoops, they bend by themselves. You don't need a special tool for it. You got to bend them into shape. You might need help, you know, the help of another person to kind of hold it in place while you're bending it to get the screws in. Um, and then a shade cloth. Shade cloths are widely available in many places. They're readily available online and they are inexpensive. Um, so just something to consider there. When it comes to finally planting out, definitely plant deep deeper than you think up to the first leaf is plenty. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of varieties of things. This is my pro tomato tip for you guys. A number of things will readily put roots out from anywhere along the stem and they will increase nutrient uptake and vigor of the plant. And you cannot, when I plant, when we plant our tomatoes, our tomato plants out on the farm, we actually use a post hole digger and we go down well over a foot and a half. And we have our, our tomatoes, we end up getting them growing into, in the, in the greenhouse and they're like two feet long. What we do is we drop them all the way down into the bottom of the hole. We pinch off the leaves all the way up just so there's a little tuft of leaves at the top and we bury them all the way up to that. You can't really do that with everything, but don't be afraid to bury them deep. They kind of hang out for a week, week and a half. And then all of those all of those roots along that stem have struck the dirt and they take off like a shot. So definitely don't be afraid to plant deeply. Uh, and when you plant them deep, you got to water them deep too. We need enough water in there to help the roots acclimate to the shock of the transplant happening, right? And so, <clears throat> excuse me, what we're trying to do is keep the water there. We're going to use two, two ways of doing that. Watering at night deeply into the soil, which means a little bit of water over a longer period of time. We're going to watch the weather. You cannot beat transplanting the day of or the day before a rainstorm. The way the rain slowly falls and soaks deeply into the soil, there is nothing better for getting your seedlings to strike and, and really, really have great success. So if you can, the day before a rainstorm is ideal, ideal. Um, water lightly, but deeply. So where do we go wrong? Well, we've already talked about all the things we should do right. So it would make sense that if we start screwing those things up, that things would start falling apart for us. But the amount of things that we have and opportunities to do things right are pretty limited and they're not really hard to do. So we should be in pretty good shape. Our common pitfalls. And if you, if you succeed at keeping these four ideas under control, you're going to have at least 80, 90% success easily. Okay. It all comes down to these things and that we've talked about them at length already. So we know why, and we know where these things come from. So problem, uh, pitfall number one, old or low quality or improperly stored seeds, right? We're talking about viability. How should we store seeds? How should they be stored? Ideally, we want the seeds to be cool, dry, and in the dark. Just think about prized family photo albums, cold or inconsistent temps. The vast majority of seeds will happily sprout at room temperature or just above within a few degrees. Really, is, if you can do that, you're going to get the seeds to grow because remember, seeds want to grow. Keep the temperatures from fluctuating wildly and that will help. What ends up happening is, you know, how many hours does the tomato seed need to be at its special comfy 86 degrees to germinate? And it spends part of the day at 61 degrees because it's on the windowsill at night. And then during the day, the sun is blasting in on the window and it's, you know, 104 degrees in the soil because you got, you know, it's just baking in the sun with the humidity dome on it. Um, 
those wild swinging temps, it's just, they make it harder to predict what's actually going on under the soil surface. And it is not how seeds are most happy. Consistent temps are best. Uh, overwatering, inconsistent moisture. Don't love too much. Don't love your seeds too hard. It's, I know it's hard. I know, believe me. I know it's too hard sometimes, but that is, that is where the diseases come in. They, all of the diseases that happen to plants are related to the moisture. The moisture is either too high and that's what the bugs like, or the moisture excludes oxygen and that's what the bugs like, or the moisture inhibits the growth of the seedling and weakens it and the bugs like a weakened seedling. Either way, the vast majority of disease pressure that we'll feel comes from maintaining proper moisture. And then lastly, not enough light leggy seedlings. Leggy seedlings are seedlings that are too long and spindly. They have weak stems. They will fall over by themselves. They generally do not transplant well, generally speaking. And it might be hard, but if you have 10 of the same kind of seedling, if five of them are leggy, I would snip them out and not even try. I would stay, stay with the five stouter fellas and, and go with those. Um, it's possible you might get the more leggy seedlings to grow for you and you might find success with them. And if you have the time and the space, then, you know, you should try. It wouldn't hurt to try, but I wouldn't hold out hope for them. And one of the ways that we keep them compact is by keeping enough light on them. And it's difficult to keep enough light on them. That's a challenge. But when we get the light as close as we can, as long as it's not too hot so that it doesn't burn and, and artificially dry out our little seedlings too quickly, we get shorter squatter seedlings. And that's, that's what we want. The shorter, the squatter, the better. Oh, damping off. Pests, okay? Listen, give yourself some grace, okay? Damping off. So, listen, they're in the soil. It's in the soil. It is airborne and floating around you. We know that molds, fungi, you know, fungal spores, it, they're, they're everywhere. They're airborne. They're floating around everywhere. It is easy to, it's easy to picture them landing on your seed starting stuff and on your supplies and on your materials. And it is easy to envision them just working their way in, no matter how clean you keep things. And so it's, if you, if you don't pay attention to the moisture, it's just going to happen. Okay. It's very difficult to avoid. All you have to do is keep an eye on the moisture because if the moisture is not there for these things to proliferate, they won't. Okay. One of the things that helps keep moisture there, which we've talked about is not overwatering. The other is airflow. Okay. Stagnant water is the enemy. Stagnant water breeds the disease. Stagnant water creates the conditions like we just mentioned. Stagnant water creates the conditions that these things flourish in. So our best and only tools are experience and cultural practices. I don't mean if you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah, I mean the physical practices, the way you organize, the way you keep your tools clean, the way you plant the seeds, the watering schedule or light schedule. Those are the cultural practices. Um, these things are around, they are endemic. And so what we're trying to do is limit their ability to succeed and proliferate. And what we want to do to make sure that happens is just really just keep the air moving around them. Airflow is important, but really it just, it really comes down to just, if you can keep them on the drier side, if you can keep your seeds and seedlings on the drier side, you will not have a problem with damping off. You can take that to the bank. Fungus gnats. Oh, they are a special free gift that comes with your growing media. The eggs are already in there for you. Surprise. You're welcome. Um, they're, ra they're, they're rarely more than a nuisance. They're, they're not really known for being vectors of disease, um, but what they can do if the problem is bad enough, they are going to start munching a little bit around the root level of some plants and they will do damage. 
when they start to work on the seedlings and they start to damage them. If the damage is enough, you start to get weaker seedlings and then weaker seedlings become susceptible to, um, to disease pressure. And that's, that's not what we want. There's a million home remedies for fungus gnats. Uh, I've never seen any of them actually work. So some people say, and if you've had, if you've had success with this, I would love to know, uh, you get like a little cup, put uh, a piece of plastic wrap over that, uh, fill the cup with vinegar and just poke a little hole and they go in the hole, attracted to the smell of the vinegar and then they die in there. I just never worked for me. Uh, sticky fly paper works, but if you're, they really also proliferate with high moisture levels. And so if you see fungus gnats, that might be a sign that your moisture levels are too high, but in the end, again, they're rarely more than just a nuisance. Pests like algae, fungi, and mosses. If these things are growing on your stuff, it means you have a living soil mixture. That's exclusively what we use. We have a living soil medium. There, It is packed with life. There is compost in it that is actively, it's not actively composting, so it's not hot, um, but there's stuff living in it. Our, <clears throat> our nursery, which is a a uh, small office space. There's worms in there. There's um, pill bugs, potato bugs. What do, you, what do you guys call them? Pill bugs with the little arthropods, little gray roly polies, I guess some people call them. Those, there's spiders even. Um, it's alive. There are beneficial mycorrhizal fungi. There are beneficial other forms of so uh, soil life, like helpful bacteria. And they work to keep the bad guys at bay by either directly predating them or by outcompeting them for resources. Um, so I see algae all the time, little green kind of tints starting to happen to stuff. I see fungi all the time, little mushrooms pop up, or I see white mycelial threads all the time. We don't really see mosses. In my experience, mosses take a long time to grow and establish. And what we're working with again is a temporary Temporary situation, so the time scale isn't really long enough to see that happen. But if it would happen and I would see it, I would be totally fine with it. Um, these are natural and normal signs of a living growing medium. They're not really a problem. Just make sure that the moisture is not too high and there's adequate airflow. If these things are for some reason a problem for you, you should be monitoring the moisture and airflow anyway. These are our best tools to fight disease and pest pressure. So um, they should be there for you and, and dialed in for you. Um, that is, that is it for my presentation. I hope I was able to give everybody, uh, some useful nuggets, some things to consider. Um, and, uh, I'd be happy to spend, to spend some time answering any questions. Um, I do have some resources listed here. Uh, Johnny selected seeds. They are, um, a seed company based out of Maine an employee owned seed company, uh, their seeds are widely regarded as some of the highest quality seeds. I can't recommend them directly, but what I am recommending for them for is their massive growers library. It is packed with information and it is all freely available to you. Um, just go ahead there to check it out. Obviously, all of us at your Virginia Cooperative Extension uh, in the Master Gardener Program, we're happy to help. Um, a book, Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth. It goes from uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of types of plants in there, uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, flowers also. Um, it's primarily focused on uh, fruits and vegetables, but um, it takes you from germinating the seed to harvesting the seed to keep the mm -hmm. seed, do seed saving, uh, and then how to grow more vegetables by John Javons uh, is a classic and then I would say on YouTube, One Yard Revolution, um, he is focused on, uh, he's focused on really thoughtfully creating healthful plant environments in his yard. I guess I would put it like that. Uh, he, he does it with as little work as possible, as cheaply as possible, and he has unparalleled success. He's growing up in zone five around Chicago, and he's got like tomatoes into like December in Chicago. And it's just, it's amazing to watch. Lots of common sense resources. The, the, um, 
the PVC frames that I built over the raised bed. That was from his design. He's got lots of great stuff to share about that. I am always also a uh, resource for you. Please absolutely reach out to me, Mockingbird Farmstead at gmail.com, my website, uh, mockingbirdfarmstead.com, and on Instagram at Mockingbird Farmstead. Any questions, any way I can help? Thank you all so much for your time and, and for your attention. I appreciate it. Justin, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, really enjoyed it. And yes, we do have questions in the Great. chat. <clears throat> so Great. I will um, hop in. Um, this sort of got answered in your um, presentation, but here's the question. How long can seed packets be kept before use? That's a great question. Um, I, I wish I had an easy answer, like seven months. Um, it, it very, very much depends on the seed. So um, from my personal experience, uh, alliums tend to not be as viable as long. Um, and again, we're talking about different dimensions of how we store the seeds. Are the seeds in ideal conditions when they're stored? Most seeds should last for a few years without a, a really noticeable drop in their germination if they're stored properly. Um, beyond that, it's going to depend most heavily on the type of seed. So for example, again, alliums, I buy new allium seeds every year. I do not carry them over from the year before. The germination rates for me drop off too sharply. Um, that might not matter to a home gardener though. And so maybe two years would be good for, uh, for alliums for you. Um, there are other seeds available, especially from harder to germinate things like uh, rosemary. Rosemary is a good example. So not many people try to seed their own rosemary, but um, rosemary seeds are available. Now they are notoriously difficult to germinate. And so they go through a process called priming where they kind of partially soak and then dry the seeds out. And then those seeds are more likely to germinate the second time they are soaked. Uh, I suspect that kind of mimics in some ways a kind of stratification type of thing um, where there are, there are different cycles of different conditions, but those are, and they're always, always clearly stated on the packets should be used within the year that they're purchased. And then lastly, a, a seed type like uh, pelleted seeds. So if they're really tiny seeds that are difficult to hold, like basil seeds, for example, something really tiny, um, they will often clump one or two of them together in a clay coating. Uh, when they do this, the seeds are moistened a little bit, and then the clay is slowly added on them. And they're rolled just like you would make jawbreakers. Um, they're rolled and tumbled, and they, get, uh, they take on a little bit of moisture and a little bit of clay. And there's a, a similar situation to when they're primed. So those should not be... We don't expect those to germinate quite as well over, over periods of time. I, I would say the larger the seed for the most part, so we're talking about beans, pumpkins, uh, those kinds of things, you get probably four or five years if they're stored properly um, or no years. If you leave it on the dashboard of your car, for example, <laughs> that's, that's just not going to, that's not going to work for you. So it really does come down. I don't, I don't want to give kind of like a half answer or hedge my bets. Um, I've left, listen, I've, I've left a packet of seeds in my truck in August in Virginia, and uh, those seeds did not grow. And, and that was a day. So um, if we're, if, if we're keeping them ideal, you should get at, at least a few years, larger seeds, um, maybe four or five years. So the long, the short answer is it depends. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> that's not really, it's not really helpful. <laughs> Was but no, really helpful, it, but. there was a lot of great information in that that answer. Thank you. Next question. Is mm -hmm. it right that geranium seeds have to be started 16 weeks before you want to plant? Ooh, I, I don't want to speak uh, to geranium seeds specifically. I, I don't have personal experience with geranium seeds. However, if... I encountered a seed. I wish my, I wish my seed knowledge at, I tell you what, I'm going to go find out today for sure. I wish my <laughs> seed knowledge was, it was, was exhaustive enough for that. I would, my first move, which is what I will do when we're done with the presentation here is to head to Johnny's. My first stop will be Johnny's selected seeds. I would go to their growers library and I would believe 
every single word that they told me about how to get geraniums growing and started because they're uh, at Johnny's, not only do they support home gardeners and the home gardener seed community, but they are supporting flower growers, uh, cut flower farms, other seed farms, uh, produce farms, grain farm, all types of farms are supported by them. And, and their, their information is exhaustive. And they, they also, they also have people just waiting online for you to message and just ask your question. So that, that is where I would go to that. I wish I'm not going to lie to you and tell you, Oh, 16 weeks, 16 weeks. The seeds need to be pointed North, Northwest. <laughs> You're going to burn a little sage before you get them. Soak them in water and then stand orange on one, juice. Yeah. Stand on one foot. Yeah. I know. Okay. Sorry. Oh, and we will include links to all of these resources in our follow-up email. Uh, next question. Some people say that some seeds need to be put in plastic bags, moistened for faster germination before mm -hmm. sowing. Is mm -hmm. that a good idea? It. Uh, oh man, I, I'm just, I'm starting to realize I'm going to get into a lot of, uh, yeah, depends. there's a lot of the pre-soaking thing. And it depends on the seed. Um, so roughly we talk about two types of seeds that can benefit from soaking. The first type would be hulled seeds and the second type would be berry like seeds. So hulled seeds are anything that has a hull on it. So a great example would be like a sunflower seed. Um, Sunflower seeds, mm. tomato seeds, anything with a hard shell. When that shell, the first thing that happens is that shell needs to become saturated with water so that that water can then penetrate into the cotyledons to get all the circuitry going inside the seed so that germination can happen. If we just put them right in water, there's nothing wetter than that. If we put them into a properly moistened soil, that's not quite as wet as just soaking them in water. That will speed up germination in that instance. Berry-like seeds are seeds like beets and like the chard family, uh, also uh, cilantro, for example. So they're not actually one seed. It's a dried berry that has multiple seeds inside it. And that dried berry, first step one is to rehydrate, and that can take days. So you can shorten that by days. Uh, but from my perspective, and this, this is just how I personally feel, I'm not is not official recommendation. From my perspective, you're gaining, let's say you even gain a full week of germination. On the span of a growing season, is that week going to make or break it? Especially if you get out early in the season when the days are shorter, the way the day length increases as things go, you can plant seeds or transplant out a week or two apart. And by the middle of the summer, those plants will be the same size because the days are longer from the start of one growing. So does it work? Yes. Does it help? Yes. Also legumes, peas, beans, those also all benefit from, from a pre-soak. They benefit by like days, not by weeks or months. Um, there are some special seeds that may it is just you know the seed is descended from a native plant that grew along a, a river's edge and it germinated during flood season and so they do need to undergo that period of extended submersion in liquid um what i think really helps when you pre-soak seeds like in a paper towel in a, in a plastic bag you can actually see them germinating and on some things that have spottier germination naturally, like for some people, carrots, this is a big problem. Parsley, they're both related. Um, people have trouble germinating these things. Um, that can help increase germination a little bit. Um, in my ex personal experience, it's not a, break, a make or break a thing. I would also advise to pay close attention to the type of seeds. So seeds like arugula, and basil, those are gelatinous seeds. And so, or chia is a great example of this also. When those get wet, instead of a, <laughs> instead of a hull softening to allow uh, water to penetrate the seed, they create a slimy, sticky, slimy, gross, sticky, gelatinous membrane around them. And if you have that happening inside a paper towel, you're not gonna be able to get those seeds out. <laughs> so don't, don't do that. Not that I've ever done that. <laughs> Okay. Wow. 
that was, again, a lot of information in there. Um, all right, so next question is, um, in starting seeds, should the containers, uh, should we use containers with holes in the bottom for drainage? So, I would say, I'm trying to think of what my setup looks like. So I have a seed, I, I use seed starting trays. Um, the cells, individual cells have holes in the bottom so that, so we always want drainage. The short answer is, yeah, we always want drainage. Um, practically speaking though, um, if you have cells with drainage and then you go to water them, how is that gonna happen for you personally? I would recommend you do what you are most likely to be successful at doing. That would be my recommendation. So if you have, so in other words, let's say I just have a four and a half inch pot and all I'm growing this year is one basil plant. And I got the little seedling to sprout and all I have is a little pot. Okay. When it's time to water, I'm going to have to take that over to the sink, water it well, allow it all to drain out, wait till it stops dripping and then put that back on the windowsill or under the light or wherever it's growing. If I had that in a tray, I could just water that tray and just, I know how much water to put in that tray and then I could just let that go. I'm much more likely to consistently do that. So that's what I'm going to do. If we're talking about a pot with no holes in terms of drainage, I do not recommend a pot with no holes or no drainage holes because that increases the likelihood that A, we can overwater without knowing it, and B, that is going to reduce, even though it's only a tiny bit, that is going to reduce airflow or availability to the roots. Because if the roots are struggling down there, they will grow towards the holes and you'll see them poking out if, they, if it's time for them to do that. Uh, if there are no holes down there, they have nowhere to go. Uh, we have no way to monitor the humidity level at the bottom of that. And that kind of runs into some, into some scary territory. Okay, good answers. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of shop light did you say you used? I use a, uh, it's a 48 inch LED shop light. Uh, they have them readily available at Home Depot, Lowe's. They're, they sell them in six packs on Amazon. Um, it is an LED shop light. It has a little pull chain on it. Um, another cool thing about the LEDs is that you can plug one into the next. And so you can get like a string of four of them, just plug them right into them right into each other. Uh, and it is a daylight colored, like a 6,500K daylight bluish kind of colder light. And fairly energy efficient. Very energy efficient, yeah. All righty. Yeah. Um, at what point in the germination process do you no longer need to use a warming pad? As soon as you see the soil surface break when the cotyledons come out and you start to see those little green leaf-like structures. As soon as that happens, you know, so we're looking backwards, really. We're looking backwards through time when we see these little things. When, we, when you see it starting to like the surface above the seeds start to bulge up a little bit and it break the surface, the germination already happened days ago. That's it, it, it the germination happened, the seed, the little root came out, the cotyledons started to poke up through the surface. That already happened days prior to you seeing that. And as soon as you see it start to break the surface, we know the conditions days in the past were right for that germination to happen. So you can take the heating pad off. Okay. The next thing comes right after that. Um, how long is the period from when you take off the dome and put them under? How long is the period? from when you take off the dome, comma, and put them under a shop light is this. Okay. So when, so when we're talking about getting, so we, again, we can never get enough light on them. It's very challenging to get enough light on them. I like to have, and this is another benefit to uh, the LEDs because they're cool. I have the LED lights resting on the humidity dome. As soon as I start to see the soil surface break and start to bulge up, the lights are on. Mm. I want the first thing those little cotyledons see to be glowing bright bluish white light. 
and I want them to see it as long as possible for as long as possible. If you're trying to save electricity or the lights make your room a little too warm or uncomfortable, you can, you know, wait. But a, every step you, every day you wait is another, another opportunity for it to get that much more leggy and, and shorter, stouter seedlings are, are the goal. All right. Uh, we have several mm -hmm. people saying thank you and super helpful, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Wonderful. Abs absolutely. My You're pleasure. A hit. <laughs> thank You're you a so hit. much. A couple more questions. When we, when we receive mail order seeds, are they already stratified? Can you stratify twice? Can you stratify twice is a great question. I would I would say absolutely you could stratify multiple times. Um, if I, so we did this last year because uh, whoopsie daisy, um, but I had Asclepias seeds that I needed to sow last year, milkweed seeds, and it was time to plant them. And so <laughs> uh, what I did was I did the stratification process over, over four days. And what I did was 12 hours in the freezer, the seeds on a damp paper towel, 12 hours at room temperature, 12 hours back in for four days. And we had really fantastic germination. They grew up to be happy, healthy butterfly uh, housing milkweeds, um, multiple stratification. So again, when we're talking about stratification, we're mimicking, we're mimicking the seasonal changes and temperature changes of the winter season, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we're thinking about also is uh, that random day, that random week in January where it's 70 degrees for four days or, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, those temperature swings. And so I, I would absolutely say that they would be stratified if your, it is unlikely that seeds would be stratified before they get to you. Um, that would require a refrigeration process and lots of things that would require close monitoring. And I don't think a company would be willing to do that for you for free. Uh, I think you would know about that. And I think it would be very clearly, very clearly stated in your, uh, in your growing instructions. Additionally, when some companies, there's not a standard definition for priming seeds. And yeah. so when we're looking at seeds that say pre-prime, try and drill down a little bit on that if you can, because that may, for whatever reason, primed seeds are more expensive than regular seeds. So that may be part of what's included in there. Okay. Um, and this is our last question mm -hmm. as, of, as of this point. Please comment on direct sowing of vegetables. So direct sowing of vegetables. Um, Okay, so I, for me, direct sowing of vegetables, it's a personal decision. And the reason I think it's personal is uh, what we're trying to balance when we direct sow, um, when we direct sow any crops is, you know, what is the longest happy period of growth that we need for this plant, crop, whatever it is? Um, we're also specifically usually talking about annuals when we're talking about this, right? Um, so for example, tomatoes, if we have an indeterminate variety of tomatoes, um, I would not want to direct sow those. I would lose six or eight weeks of, you know, last year we were harvesting tomatoes into November, uh, from the second last week of June. If I would have direct sowed them we would have had tomatoes at the end of July into August. We would have missed a month, at least a month of, of harvesting of delicious sun ripened tomatoes. And that's a big concern. Um, it's a big, it's a big concern for me because I love our tomatoes. They're so good, but also from a business perspective, that's a concern, right? I need to get those. I don't like the idea of pers I personally don't like the idea of hothouse tomatoes or cucumbers for that matter. Um, I think tomatoes always taste better when they're grown out in the heat in the sun. And so that's what we try to do. We try to give them as much time there as possible, but those are long season, right? Brussels sprouts, long season, onions, long season, potatoes, sweet potatoes, long season. And so those longer season things we tend to get started 
as quickly as we can. Those are crops I would recommend starting indoors. Shorter season things like lettuces, arugula, mustards, those leafy kinds of greens like that, peas, beans, especially snow peas. I mean, we have varieties of snow peas now where you start getting peas in like 32 days. Um, it, you, there's not really a big benefit there. We're not gaining huge amounts of time from those things. We could also do succession crops of those things. And the last part is how are you going to harvest the things? And so um, tomatoes are harvested off of the vine. The vine is established for a long period of time. If it's a head of lettuce, we're just kind of cutting the top off of the lettuce. If it's a cabbage, we're just kind of taking the cabbage. The rest of the plant just kind of doesn't really, I mean, cabbage, you get some mini heads off of it if it's in good health. Um, some varieties of lettuce are cut and come again, but if it's a head lettuce, it's not, you cut the head off, you're done. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if it would continue on then, and continue producing, and we have that longer window where we'd be able to harvest from it, then that's kind of, that's when I'd want to start it more indoors versus, versus direct sowing. And then another thing popped up, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> direct sowing of flowers. And I would think once again, yeah, it, it, it depends. It does depend. Uh, it does depend on a direct sowing of flowers. Um, we're also talking about um, what, how are they sowed? So uh, <clears throat> other great things that I would really only directly sow are like uh, carrots. Uh, carrots, I, I really, I think, do best when they're directly sown. A lot of root crops, people argue that they don't do well if you try to transplant them, and I understand why that thinking would be there. We do very well with our transplanted beets, and they're, they're very easy to do. But also, those things are, when we direct sow those, those are buried in the dirt a little bit, quarter inch, half inch deep. And if they only take a week or so to germinate, then I'm not so much, I'm not really so worried about them. But if we were doing things that had finer seeds, fluffier seeds that were sown on the surface, I might be worried about those and the time of year that we sow them. We have wet falls here. Uh -huh. um, if I have really fine seeds that I would sprinkle on the surface during the fall and hope you know, I, I would be worried that those would wash away over an extended period of time if they don't have a short germination time. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what I try to think about there. Um, I have not seen the only the only flowers in terms of flowers. Uh, the only flowers that I recommend really only direct sowing are sunflowers. The sunflower seedlings that I showed were an experiment we did with tiny dwarf varieties that were branching and those did okay. But sunflowers for as tall as the sunflower is, there's a fat taproot that goes straight down. And if mm -hmm. that taproot's growth is stunted, if milkweed growth, that taproot, similar thing, if that, if that root growth is stunted, they have a really tough time recovering from that, especially if there's transplant shock when we're, when we're setting those, uh, setting those flowers out. So, but other than that, I, you know, direct sowing is, is probably, is, is probably okay. I would say really direct sowing is, would be recommended for, for those big, those big root systems or, or root systems that don't like to be disturbed. Uh, cucumbers notoriously don't like being disturbed. Um, milkweed doesn't like to be disturbed. Um, those kinds of things. Uh, otherwise, you know, that they would be okay, but I, I think you have much finer control if you're starting them from seeds indoors under controlled conditions. So do that if you can. Well, this has been fabulous. I think we have answered all of the questions. Fantastic. And more thank yous. And I think we're going to call it. Thank Great. you so much for your expertise, your knowledge, and your willingness to share it. It's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you again to everybody for, for coming to listen and for your attention and your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll see you next month on compost. Yeah. Let's talk about some compost. All right. Thanks. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much.